Hello, friends, and welcome once again to another episode of Strange Planet. In the three years between 2010 and 2013, Texas aircraft repair shop owner Clay Wheeler, his wife, and his employees experienced an array of events at Sparks County Airport that make the events at Utah Skinwalker Ranch pale by comparison. UFO sightings, alien intrusions, poltergeist activity, spirit manifestation, demir- uh, demonic presences and possessions, assaults, shootings, a government raid, and a plain old murder. We're going to get into that right now. Pat O'Connell is a communications consultant of, for high-tech corporations in fields as varied as nuclear power, aerospace, and antibody library solutions. She's also a researcher, novelist, and nonfiction author with eclectic interests from science and medicine to history and psychology to metaphysics and paranormal. And she helps individual clients manifest their own book publication dreams. And through it all, she remains an activist for truth and freedom. And her book is Bleed Through, a true story of aliens, demons, and pure evil in Texas. Pat O'Connell, welcome to Strange Planet. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for inviting me, Richard. So um, let's give my listeners kind of a primer on the Clay Wheeler case. Tell us everything we need to know about what happened to Clay uh, Wheeler in uh, Sparks County, Texas. Well, uh, to open it up, uh, he he was uh, an aircraft repair technician, had his own business, um, and he owned a, a hangar at this little bitty airport in the middle of nowhere in Texas. And uh, on in the hangar, he had uh, an apartment attached to it with an office in between the hangar and the apartment. And so he was living there. He was pretty much the only one there uh, 24-7. Uh, and he had employees who, were, who worked there. And he had been there for, uh, I don't know, 10 years before all of this stuff started happening in 2010. And then he started seeing craft in the sky and at first it was just a light moving in the sky that in a way that he knew conventional craft aircraft or spacecraft or whatever couldn't do and then he started playing laser tag with these uh these dots in the sky and he found that they would jump or move or zoom in uh again in a way that normal craft couldn't do And then over time, he started having, like in the middle of the night, uh, there there would be, sometimes it was conventional craft, like, uh, you know, the Mexican hat style or the sportster kind of UFOs. Uh, And they would come down real close. In uh, several cases, they hovered over the airfield or over the, the runway, Uh, In several cases, they would hover and then shoot up into the sky and then dive into the ground. And he's like, you know, when it first started happening, he'd go out to that spot in the airfield or on the runway and look for, you know, is there a splat or is there a hole or is there some uh, sense that something had gone into the ground here and never found anything. Um, So, you know. I got involved in this story um, through my brother, Jim O'Connell, who who had his own group, his own investigative uh, group called Experiencers with an X, just an X at the beginning. Uh, and they would uh, talk to people. They're, they wanted to tell the stories of experiencers. They didn't, they weren't interested in describing the vehicles. In fact, my brother would get, really upset when people focused on the vehicles. He said, it's about the experience, whether it was real, objectively real or not, it deeply affected the lives of these people who had had these experiences. So he was developing a TV show called Experiencers. And, um, and it was all about telling the story of these people who had had, who had had life-changing uh, events happen to them. And so one day he called me and he said, you know, I've, I've got this guy here in Texas. Uh, well, he was in Connecticut. My brother was in Connecticut. And of course I'm in Texas. And he said, you know, there's, there's this guy in Texas and he's had so much happen to him. It wasn't just, I was abducted. It wasn't just, I saw UFO uh, or aliens. 
it was so many things. He said, I can't cover it in one episode, maybe not even if I did a three episode arc, I couldn't cover it. So he asked me if I would be interested first in meeting this guy and kind of vetting him Mm -hmm. for my brother in advance. Uh, And, and two, would I be interested if, if this guy seems like the real deal, uh, would I be interested in writing maybe a book or a screenplay or all of the above uh, to cover the breadth of his story? So, and then (laughs) my brother said, and by the way, this guy says he's shot and buried an alien. Wow. And of course my eyes bugged out and I'm like, you know, my head was spinning thinking, oh my God, you know, this can't be real, first of all. And second of all, if it is real, this would be earth shaking. Mm. And how could I not at least dig a little further and find out what's going on? So of course I was totally in. And what, so what was how, the um what was the the local the local uh coverage of this? Was there any were was the, the were the media contacted uh aside from your brother Jim who was developing a TV series? Was it getting any um, paper any newspaper he, coverage? At one point, um, Clay talked to the local, uh, talked to a local reporter. Now this, again, this is in a little bitty town. Um, And they ran a story with some of his images, but they, the image on on the, in the newspaper, but the images looked like just a, a, a squiggly light. And if you've seen any coverage of the Stephenville sightings, Mm -hmm. it looked like some of those original uh, images. And it's just like, okay, I'm looking at, I'm taking a picture of a moving dot of light in the sky. And obviously you're going to get moving artifacts of camera movement. Um, So, and he didn't really want that kind of attention. So that really was it. And it, the story did not go anywhere after that and so you know time passed and he uh he started noticing that um there were there were strange effects on his employees and his wife when once she moved into the apartment that he built on the end she started she started out uh having you know she was this nice sweet personality and you know wouldn't swear she had to and her personality changed and, and other people did too. the, the employees, he said, when they clocked in their personalities went dark and they would become, they'd get angry and they'd fight and all this kind of stuff. But her personality really changed. And, um, he, to the point where in the end he felt like she had been possessed by demons or something. He, in the end, he started to believe that this was all a demonic phenomenon but uh he had seen aliens and and i can go more into yeah we'll get we'll get into that for sure timeline of that for sure okay so when was your first meeting with clay it was in uh i think it was in early 2015 and uh, i mean i had i had been corresponding with him and talking with him on the phone for months before we uh my my husband and i went out there to meet him at the airport now he had by this time moved away from the airport. And um, so we met in the town and then he took us out to the airport to show us around. But that was in, that was in 2015, maybe spring of 2015. And by this point, because the, the um, phenomena was occurring between 2010 and 2013, had all of the phenomena for the most part stopped at this point? Okay. Um, Yeah. So there were people, still in the area uh, after he moved away that he was aware of uh, one lady contacted him, actually two ladies who had seen uh, those things. They were about 20 miles away um, and they were still seeing things. There were people right in that same town who re- had reported uh, seeing these craft or balls of light that were diving into the ground, just like he had some of the things he had seen. So um, it was still going on when we met him and he was saying, you know, I guarantee if you come out there and you spend the night at the airport, almost guaranteed you'll see something. Well, when we were there the first time it was rainy, it was a whole rainy weekend. We didn't really see anything. Um, 
so, you know, we, we didn't end up staying overnight, but um, we did another time and didn't okay. see anything either. All right. What was your, your first, upon your first meeting with Clay, what were your, your impressions? What did he, how did he seem? He was, um, he was kind of nervous. Um, and I think he was expecting us to um, make fun of him, you know, ridicule him. Uh, and so that's part of why he didn't spread his story. Uh, he was afraid that people were going to think he was crazy. So he was a little bit nervous. And um, so, you know, I just wanted to interview him. I wanted to get information from him. But our initial meeting in that moment, he was, once he realized that we were really listening, that, that we cared and we were respecting his experiences, whatever they were, um, then he was just gushing. He was, we call it the fire hose effect, you know, where he was just, oh, and there, and then this happened and then that happened and he wouldn't finish a whole story. He was jumping from one to another. And then he had two laptops and he'd say, well, and here's a picture and he'd show, you know, or then he'd spend 10 minutes trying to find a picture on the other laptop. And so it was really kind of manic that first, that first meeting. And the, the key turning point in that first meeting was um, when he was he was showing me images and, and footage of these uh, what he called rods, and I'm sure your audience yeah. has probably heard of them rods or skyfish they call them, and they supposedly are creatures from another dimension. Well, they look like snakes or worms with a whole bunch of wings on them. Well, I explained to him that this was something that was easily debunked, and we that we needed to to debunk things like that. I said, it's, uh, it, it's really a multiple exposure or a long exposure of just a regular old moth or some kind of flying insect. And so he was kind of resistant to that. And I said, well, there was this great, I think it was a national geographic, uh, documentary where they had, uh, a, a uh, regular video camera and then a high speed video camera and then a high speed timer in between. So both cameras, uh, shot f footage of this timer and they were in the dark out near a cave and um they had they had turned on the lights and then then they filmed what they saw well in the regular camera it's you know it looks like the sky fish in the high speed camera you can see it freezes the the motion and it's a moth or whatever and so clay was kind of reluctant to to accept that and he said well yeah, I've seen that, but uh, that's not what this was. And I said, we need to debunk things that are easy to debunk mm. because I believe that you've had some really extraordinary experiences. And I don't want our audiences to be distracted from those by these other things. And so he seemed to get that. And then after we, after we left him and he sent it, he sent me an email and he said, you know, I debunked something on my own, he had seen, he had taken a picture of something he thought was, he said was a baboon face that was just floating in midair. And he said, it turned out to be, and again, it was rainy that weekend. He was on his way home. It was in the dark. There was rain on his windshield and he took a picture and it turned out to be the backside of a stop sign in the distance. So, you know, it was pareidolia, this, this pattern recognition. I explained to him, it's like seeing seeing patterns in the, you know, seeing a, a rabbit or a, you know, whatever face of Jesus in the clouds or mm -hmm. something. And uh, so he understood that and he appreciated the fact that I wanted to basically clear away the, the debris so that when we presented his experiences, that people were going to be able to uh, in, in writing novels, I, they call it suspending disbelief. I wanted his audiences to just set aside any disbelief they had because we had already explained away the the easily debunked stuff. And so he he, he appreciated that. And you want his so, trust, I guess, because he knew that exactly. you were serious about bringing to light the the stuff that couldn't be easily dismissed or debunked. We'll, uh, we'll take right. a quick time out, Pat. We'll come back and okay. uh, discuss this remarkable case. Clay Wheeler uh, witnessing an array of paranormal phenomena at Sparks County Airport back in uh, 2010 through 2013. And uh, Pat is the author of Bleed Through, a true story of aliens, demons, and pure evil in Texas. Back with more of our conversation after this quick time out. 
Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So help me fight big tech censorship. Enjoy the complete unedited episodes and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there. Pat O'Connell is here. The website, xexperiencers.com. The link is in the episode notes in the book, Bleed Through, A True Story of Aliens, Demons, and Pure Evil in Texas. Um, I want to jump right to the, uh, the Clay Wheeler story of shooting an alien. How did you bring, or how did he get into that story and just kind of walk us through? Yeah, the, the, uh, his encounters with the aliens kind of progressed. So the first encounter, he, he saw a sh a, an X-shaped ship on top of the hangar uh, coming back from the grocery store, and it was kind of off in the distance, and there was a kind of a stick figure-looking creature next to it that ran into the ship, and it flew off. But he, he didn't really get, it, get a good look at it. So the first real good look he got at the aliens, he was – he was, he woke up at three o'clock in the morning. Um, he couldn't sleep. And, um, so he thought, well, I'll just call my sister. She was working in China at the time. So that was middle of the day for her. And so he called her and he was chatting and he was kind of telling her about weird stuff. And he, he described some of the ships that he had been seeing and things like that. And while he was talking to her on the phone, he, he was just kind of an antsy, you know, guy. And so he, paced around the room and then he walks over to the door that leads from his apartment into the office that's between the apartment and the hangar and he opens the door just kind of not even thinking about it and he opens the door and it took a while for it to register in his brain what he was saying but he opened the door and on his left he sees two gray aliens and he said they were they they were dressed in silver, so he couldn't really tell where their flesh was from their suits. But he said the weird thing was that, and they were maybe three and a half, four feet tall. And he said the weird thing was he, he stepped into the, just barely stepped over the threshold. And he said these two aliens, these gray aliens, moved out of the way like they were joined. And they moved away like a gate. And that was weird. And then he looks to his right and he sees this tall guy who is presumably naked, but naked like a Ken doll. You mm -hmm. know, there were no features on it. It was tan colored. It wasn't silver. It wasn't gray like the alien, the other aliens. Clearly this was alien, but it was tall and it had a large head and its eyes were like baseballs that are not that big, but they were like bulging out of the sockets. And he said he ha it had two big lobes that protruded from the back of the head. And he said he knew right away that this guy was the bodyguards or something like that for the two little guys. And then he said that big guy stepped forward and he said, I freaked out and I backed out of the room, shut the door, dropped the phone and... It, you know, it wasn't till like the next morning that he was brave enough to open the door and see if they were still there. So that was his first encounter. Um, and then um, 
he and his secretary were in the in the hangar one night, and it was slightly after working hours, so maybe five or six o'clock in the evening, and they were the only two left. And they heard some noises, and they saw this small figure, uh, and the secretary thought, oh, my God, there's a kid in the hangar, and we're out in the middle of nowhere. So if a kid is lost, this kid is really, really lost. So, you know, she's calling to the, you know, she's sweet talking and trying to be nice and calm the kid down and, and Clay is coming in. But by this time, you know, he's now seen aliens, he's seen ships and he's carrying guns with him all the time. He is scared, but he's also interested. So, you know, he he doesn't necessarily want to hurt them, but he wants to protect himself if he needs to. So, the, they they fi- they move around and then finally this creature comes out in the clearing. First, it was kind of hiding behind tanks of explosive gas gases because they use acetylene for for welding and they have all kinds of other volatile gases that could explode. So, you know, they needed this creature to move out of the way for him to even be able to shoot him. And so he get, he he gets the secretary to move out of the way. So she's not going to be in the line of fire. And this thing comes out, this blue, this bluish gray alien, and it shoots a blue light out from a, something in its chest, you know, a, kind of a, 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 I don't know, breastplate or something. Mm-hmm. And it's like four, four inches in diameter laser beam like thing. And it shoots out through the hangar, cuts basically vaporizes everything in its path, including a hole in the outside wall of the hangar, which is corrugated steel. So now he knows that these things can kill. He doesn't know if they're out to get him or what, what their agenda really is, but he knows, and he's, he also knows that he probably can't defend himself really with guns against something like this. So um, then more time passes and so there's another alien that shows up in the hangar and he shoots it and it falls and it starts to outguess something and it and and they're all coughing there are two or three other guys that are with him it's broad daylight is this a gray alien a little a little gray another another gray alien so the yes the other two are are gray so he shoots this and they and they're starting to choke and cough so they leave the hangar and so they wait a while. When they come back, they're thinking that they're going to find a body. Well, the, there was no body. So he's thinking, you know, he didn't really want to kill them. You know, he want he wanted so desperately to know what they knew. To you know, he he one night he packed a bag and sat out on the runway all night, hoping that they would come and take him and and take him for a joyride. You know, and so there there was this definite love hate thing going on, but uh, so he was kind of hoping that their paramedics had come and got this, this guy that he shot. He, he didn't really want to kill an alien. So now more time passes and it's just him and one of his other employees. But by this time, all of this stuff that had gone on and I haven't even gotten into the, the crazy stuff with his wife, but all this stuff had started to, cause problems for his business. So it his business was booming there for a while. And you know, if you you know how it is in if you're a, an aviator, if you're in the aviation business, you don't talk about seeing UFOs, you don't talk about seeing crazy things or not good for business. Gonna, yeah. It's exactly. So as the word started to leak out, then business started to go downhill, he started losing employees and all that. So finally he was down to just him and one other guy and the other guy had gone out, gone into town and he sees this other alien and he shoots it and the, he's he's got the body. And so he's like, Oh my God, what do I do? And he said, if you had told me five years ago that I would have an alien body and I didn't like, put it in my truck and drive all over the country telling everybody going on Oprah and CNN and every TV show and newspaper and everything, I would have called you crazy. But in the moment when it happened, 
he felt like he, he felt like a murderer. And I didn't really realize how profound that was until I had to pull and pull and pull on him to get me to tell more about that experience. And in the end, he felt like, you know, people are going to hear this and they're going to, they're going to think I'm a monster. And I said, no, you were defending yourself. I mean, if it was a bear that came into your house, you would have shot it. And he said, well, maybe. So I realized that he was a really soft hearted guy. And this all seemed and credible as he's telling it, the emotion and everything. It was, and that, see, for me, I'm, I consider myself a, a true skeptic. So I can be convinced with enough evidence, um, but I'm not a pushover. But his, his body language, his emotions, everything seemed consistent with this being a real experience as he be- believed it. Now, it could have been hallucinations, but whatever it was, he was 100% believing it. He was not, ma- I don't believe he was making it up. And the, and I don't the, believe he was lying. The other encounters, the other um, um, incident in which he shot an alien, alien were, were there witnesses, the employees or his wife? There were, there were two guys and um, I have not been able to track them down yet, but I have a team now. <laughs> <laughs> just last year I've been putting together a team and, and we've got now people, investigators who can, who are trying to track down some of these, uh, the, the witnesses. Now, some Clay said they, the witnesses didn't want to talk about it. Um, but you know, I did meet with one guy last year. He did not see those, those instances, but, um, I had a nice conversation with him and he believed that the events were, demonic as well wow okay so back to uh clay having shot this and killed uh presumably this gray alien right so so he's thinking i need time i I don't know what to do and so he wrapped it up in black plastic put it in a box and took it to his cousin's restaurant his cousin had a walk-in freezer at the restaurant and he told his cousin i've got this feral hog. We've got pigs all over Texas and uh, people, sh- people shoot them and some eat them. And so he said, oh, yeah, I shot this feral hog and I, I need to just freeze it for a while and I don't have room. Uh, so he kept it in the freezer for a while until he realized that he needed to do right by this creature that was, he believed was just one of God's creatures. And so he brought it back and he buried it and he had a nice little you know, whatever service he thought would be appropriate. Um, But he didn't, he didn't want, he didn't want to make a big deal out of it. He He buried it at the airport, at the airport, he buried it. Yes. Well, out in that area. Yeah. Near the airport. And, uh, you know, he and his wife had property out near there um, that they, the reason he had built that apartment on the end of the hangar was that they could live there cheaply while they built a house on the property that they own nearby. So, um, yeah, it's not far, not far from the airport. Did anyone else see the alien body? No, no. Um, not that I know of. Now he said he took a couple of pictures with his flip phone, but if you remember flip phones, the, the, picture on it was like the size of postage stamp Mm -hmm. and you know you know if he showed it to anybody they wouldn't know what they're looking at they're thinking why is this guy taking pictures of his garbage so um but in the meantime before we so by the time he's there by himself and shot that alien a lot had happened with his wife who by that point was his ex-wife. So I told you that her personality was most, most affected by what went on there. And so the, all the, her first, first her personality changed. She started becoming more angry. She started swearing. She was mean and things like that. Well, then one morning she woke up and she had her belly look like she was eight months pregnant overnight. And Clay was freaking out because he's thinking what in the world, you know, bit you or did you eat that could have caused this? And I need to get you to the doctor right now, or you're going to explode. 
So she did not want him to take her to the doctor and she fought and she ran and she ended up kicking him in the head. She climbed up on the couch and she, she was being like, she was Possessed. kind of lur- mm-hmm. luring him in and then she kicked him in the head and he ended up hitting his head on the, the tile floor and he was knocked out for a while. By the time he came to, she was gone. When she came back, like several hours later, her belly was flat. So we don't know what that was. Hmm. Um, and then the next thing that happened was he was concerned that she might, she was behaving a little strangely like she was maybe jealous of uh, a, a couple of his female employees. And so he wanted to take her out to dinner and talk to her and, you know, assure her that, you know, they were no threat. So they're out at dinner and she starts getting angry. And so they leave and they're out in the parking lot and they had two cars because she had to go to work. And he was standing there talking to her at her truck, holding on to the door. And then she slammed the door with his hand in the door mm. and took off. So she dragged him from her truck for, I don't know, a mile and a half or something like that. It wasn't that far, but it was far enough that by the time she stopped and released him, um, he tumbled and fell, you know, rolled into a ditch or something, but he said he had multiple broken ribs. He had uh, bones broken in his both arms and in one leg. So he was in the hospital for quite a while healing from that. And then in a wheelchair after that. Um, And then the third thing that happened was after, after she dragged him, He's like, you know, I think, I think you need to move out, go move in with your sister for a while. Cause something about this airport and, you know, for all I know, there could have been toxic gases or something in the water or right. something that was causing hallucinations. I don't think that was happening because it was, people were seeing things farther away, but, uh, you know, looking for rational explanations. And he's saying, you know, you need to be away from the airport because this is not good for you and it's not good for anybody else. So she's no longer living there. But one day she drives up to the airport and she's got his snub nose 38 and she starts shooting across the hangar. I mean, his, he's got a, all of his crew is there working and she starts taking shots until she emptied the gun. And after that happened, you know, the police were called, she was arrested and then he divorced her. So that was a whole other crazy thing that went on that he couldn't explain. But at one point he said, he said, when all this started out, he said, I was, I was about as religious as a hog. And then throughout all of this, he started seeing more and more connections to religion. And I don't know whether it was just, I'm desperate. um, And I, I don't know where to turn um, that he started reconnecting. He was, he he was raised Catholic and his mom was Catholic. And um, so I think that was part of it that that his his faith started to come back as as something to hold on to to help him through this craziness and um so toward the end he was there at the apartment by himself and one night he comes out into the living room and it's a teeny tiny airport I mean a teeny tiny apartment and um he comes out into the living room and he sees this blue figure and it was like, he said, it was an angel. He called it an angel, but it was like made out of plasma, like, like, um, some kind of energy form and it was blue and it was undulating. And he said, I thought it was an angel. And I, but I, but I was thinking to myself, she's got brown hair and angels don't have brown hair. And then he said, I thought to myself, who says angels have to have blonde hair? <laughs> so it was, you know, his his internal dialogues were really interesting to find out how he was thinking and all that. So he's seeing this, this blue, this angel made out of some kind of energy field, and he kind of is walking around trying to see if he could find the edges of it. Uh, what does it feel like? Is there something, you know, 
just trying to figure it out. And he said, and then this dark energy field started to come up from the floor. And he said, it, it was like the dark energy was trying to seduce or hurt this light energy, this angel energy. And he said, there was this kind of a, I don't know, kind of a tussle with different colors of energy. And eventually the blue blue energy prevailed. And so he said, you know, was this uh, some kind of a play acting out good versus evil? And it was showing me that good was going to prevail or what? So this whole experience was just this multidimensional. Oh, and speaking of dimensional, there was a portal that he saw at one point. Um, and um, so it, he didn't really know how to describe this because it wasn't just aliens. It wasn't just UFOs. It wasn't just possession. Then there was the portal. One night he saw uh, what looked like a light door opening on the airfield near the little terminal building. And he said, all these ships started coming out. And then there were creatures coming out, like it was a parade or something. Wow. And, uh, and, and there were, uh, there was, he called it a man walking wolf. So it was this big wolf, but seemed to, to walk on its hind legs. Like a dog man. Yeah. And, and I, I've had people say that that's, that's a perfect description for the dog man. Um, and he's like, it, and it only lasted an hour. And he said when, when it was all over and this, this door closed, this light door closed, he said, I stopped and I was thinking, I should have been taking notes as to what came out to make sure everything went back in. <laughs> so, you know, so it was, um, it, it, well, yeah, not kidding. When, um, you, you mentioned, you know, this is like skinwalker ranch exactly. t- times 10. Pat, we'll take another time out, come back sure. and uh, continue to discuss the clay wheeler case. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So help me fight big tech censorship. Enjoy the complete unedited episodes and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there. Pat O'Connell is with us, Bleed Through, a true story of aliens, demons, and pure evil in Texas. Why is it called Bleed Through? Well, because he, the the way Clay described what was happening there, he said it was like a bleed through to another dimension. He said there were times when he thought that, you know, are these are these creatures really here or are they going about their own business in their own dimension? And the veil between our dimension and theirs just happens to thin. And suddenly we're seeing each other when we normally wouldn't. So I thought that was a really good explanation for, for whatever this is. And, you know, the same, you know, you mentioned the the skinwalker, there were things that happened at, at skinwalker that were they really, happening there they 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 would they, they saw a portal actually it was the uh, the first group uh, uh, the nids scientists mm-hmm. um, that uh, were out there and they were up on a ridge and one guy could see the portal and a hundred hundred yards further away another guy couldn't see it 
So it was, it was, it seemed like it wasn't happening in our normal three dimensional reality. So that was the, that was the origins of the, of the bleed through title. Um, did he have any other video or photographic evidence? He had a lot of photographic evidence, and I was so excited before I saw it to think that I was going to have, you know, cut and dried proof of aliens. Here, Here's the ships, here's the aliens, that sort of thing. And in the end, the photographs that he had were not really convincing to me. Um, there were some things that I can't explain. So, I mean, there were there are a few photographs. Uh, actually, they're on the website, experiencers.com. Um, and there's one video clip that, as a, as a skeptic, I cannot explain it away. And it's, it's a picture of a, he called it the energy craft. And what it looks like to me, it's a ball of light that comes in, uh, and it's like a minute. It comes in toward the center of the frame, and then it's there. It changes character in in some way, and then it flies off overhead, you know, and out of frame. And I'm thinking, I looked at it, and I, I I've looked at it so many times, and it appears that, you know, my question was, is it big and far away, or is it small and close? And looking at it, really looking at it a lot of times, I could see that the light seemed to shine on a reflect off of one or more of the vehicles outside because he's it, the, the video is taken from his uh, security camera. So it looked like it's close and the light is in it and it's got its own light source. It's not reflecting off of It's not reflecting light off of something else. It's got its own light source and it's shining on the hood of a car or whatever's outside. And so I'm thinking, I don't know what bug or phenomenon could cause that. So that's still, you know, the jury's out on that one. Um, But as for all of the, like the, the big ships that he saw, he, tried to get pictures, he tried to get video, and for various reasons, and I don't know if it was just the nature of the of the moment, you know, you're you're just stunned when something like this happens and you can't focus or you it's too dark. In a lot of cases it was so dark that all he got was shadow on shadow. So there was really nothing there. Um one night there was a ship that came down. Um, he had seen it before. It was oblong shaped. So he said it was like a hard shell eyeglass case. And the first time he saw it, he, he said it hit him with a headache beam. And he thought, he thought it was trying to communicate with him. He said the first thing that happened was it felt like somebody had poured warm, warm water into me and it was pouring down through my body. And he said, I found, this was another one of those interesting insights into what, the way he thought. He said, I thought it was like what a computer must feel like when it's downloading data. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like right. how cool is that? Um, and so he said, he told his friends, I thought, you know, I think they're trying to communicate with him and his other friend and one of his friends says, no, I think they're trying to kill you. So this explains, you know, this kind of gives you a little glimpse into his character that he wanted to believe the best in them, even no matter what happened. Um, and so later on in the story, when he was there, just him and another employee, this same shape craft, I don't know if the same, if it was exactly the same craft, but it was hovering over the entrance into the airport, and he said it was so low, he said I was able to reach up and touch the bottom of it with my hand. And I'm like, oh, my God, what did it feel like? And he said it felt like wet leather. Hmm. And he felt like it was organic, like the ship itself was alive. 
And then the ship sprayed him. And it was, he ended up with these massive burns all over his body, he ended up in the hospital again. Um, and the doctors debated over whether it was chemical burns or radiation burns. And for a long time, I couldn't figure out how could they not know. And then I thought, what if it was a chemical burn? What if this ship either purposely or defensively, reactively sprayed him because, you know, just it's just a knee jerk kind of thing. And it was a chemical thing. But what if, like Bob Lazar talks about, the radiation, the, the fuel source is some kind of radioactive element that we're not familiar with? And so, he, yes, he did have radiation burns from maybe the fuel source in the ship, um, but he also had the chemical burns overlaid and the doctors wouldn't know. So this, this is a curiosity that I'm still, I'm still hoping that I'll be able to talk to the doctors who treated him. So... Take us back to uh, the um, the burial of the alien, um, and your brother Jim wanted to go out to to excavate, but unfortunately yes. he he passed away before that. Yeah, he was um, he had been having trouble getting permission to come out to film, and he wasn't even asking for permission to dig. They knew nothing about a buried alien out in that area, um, and so he said, you know, I'm just going to come and. Uh, so right before he was to come to Texas, I got a call in the middle of the night and it was my niece. And she said, my brother was dead and he had a heart attack. So uh, that was, that really just crushed me and Clay. Uh, Clay had become very close with Jim because Jim, my brother believed he had been abducted by aliens. So Clay felt like he had a, a you know, a fellow uh, experiencer who got him, who understood what it was like to, to, to ma- have these claims that people think, you know, that make people think you're crazy. And so he could talk to Jim in ways he couldn't talk to anybody else. So he and Jim had become very close. They were like brothers. Sometimes they fought like brothers, but, um, so a year after Jim had died, um, I decided I needed to do something to, to, to acknowledge him. And so I made a uh, video memorial for, for Jim. And I sent it out to everybody who knew, (laughs) who knew him. I, I sent it out to everybody on Facebook who he had contacted people all over the world. And so I posted it as much as possible to get to all those people who knew him, who he had talked to, because he had interviewed all these people who had had experiences. And I knew that they wanted, they would want to know. And so I I contacted everybody there. I emailed everybody I knew he knew uh, that I had email addresses, but we lost a lot of that stuff, but I never heard back from Clay. And I knew that as close as he had been with Jim, he would have watched this and he would have said something to me because Clay and I were still in touch, you know, even after Jim died, we still talked two or three times a week, if not more than that. And we emailed back and forth all the time. And I hadn't heard from Clay and I hadn't heard from Clay. And finally I contacted his sister and I said, you know, that I, I, I'm a little bit worried because I haven't heard from him in a while. And I knew that his health had been failing throughout all of these experiences that three and a half years, his health had gone downhill. Obviously he had had some, you know, bad things happen to him, like being dragged from a car and being sprayed by who knows what and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so I was really worried and he, I knew he had all kinds of other health issues um, by the end. And so I hadn't heard from him and I contacted his sister and I said, is he okay? And she said, no, he's, he's been in the hospital for a month and he's got flesh eating bacteria and multiple organ failure. And, um, she said, if they, if he survives this, they're going to have to, uh, do multiple skin transplants. They've had to cut off huge swaths of his skin to, to stop that. And um, 
And then the next day she emailed me that he had died. So now both of the people, the primary people involved in this investigation are dead. Uh, did you have any clues as to where the alien body was buried? I do. I do. He had given me uh, rough instructions as to where to find it. And so I now have a team uh, with, and it took a while and I never dreamed that it would just, that, that I would find those people or they would find me, but we've got ground penetrating radar. We've got LIDAR. Um, we've got a bomb technician because, and this is why I have not revealed the actual location. Clay told my husband that he may have booby trapped the location, the burial location and using uh, hand grenades so the last thing we want is for anybody reading the book to try to find this place and start digging holes and blow themselves up. Now, whether or not he really did, we don't know. Uh, but he said, I've been on, I, I was on a lot of drugs at the time. And when normally when you hear somebody say that, you think they were, you know, recreational drug users, but he was on painkillers and all kinds of drugs for the various things that had happened to him. And then the ail ailments that grew over, over time. So um, he couldn't be sure by the time we talked to him, and this is another layer to this story. We couldn't be sure if his memory was reliable and he couldn't. So he was trying to tell us, I'm not sure, but you know, just to be safe, you need to treat this burial location as if it's as if it's got explosives in it. So we've got a bomb technician with many many years in the military. We've got bomb sniffing dogs. We've got um, we've got an exobiologist uh, on the team uh, to analyze some uh, some of the uh, alien implant samples that my brother had collected, including one from him. So we've got more going on than just Clay's story. Uh, so, and, you know, again, like I said, we've got uh, investigators who are trying to track down these witnesses that he, that may have seen or been with him when these events happened. So there's still a whole lot more that's not in the book and that hopefully we're going to find a whole lot more interesting stuff. This uh, has potential to be bigger than Roswell, don't you think? I, I think it does if it if it's real, and you know, the part of me keeps thinking it can't possibly be real. It's too far fetched. But by the same token, you know, like I said, Clay never sought out uh, publicity. He sought out researchers who could explain it, who could help him cope with it. So, Pat, an amazing story. I can't wait to hear the uh, the results of your. Uh, investigation bleed through a true story of aliens demons and pure evil in texas and the website is in the uh, the uh, link is in the episode description experiencers.com x the letter x experiencers.com the book available at amazon and uh, everywhere good books are sold i'm guessing it's available at amazon we're working on the audio book now hopefully it'll be out in the next month or so pat remarkable thank you so much for sharing Thank you, Richard. This has been great. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is... I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So help me fight big tech censorship. Enjoy the complete unedited episodes and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there.
Hey there, friends. Welcome to another installment of Strange Planet. And it's stranger than you can possibly imagine. And if you'd like to get deeper into Strange Planet and follow me down the rabbit hole, you can become a premium subscriber. It's real easy to do. Just click on the link in the episode notes, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm. You gain access to commercial-free listening, special bonus episodes twice monthly that are produced exclusively for premium subscribers, and you also receive my monthly newsletter, Inner Sanctum, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm. So I received uh, a rather disturbing, kind of chilling email from a good friend of the program and a friend of mine. Uh, And um, basically, well, let me just read it here. I hope this finds you well in these tempestuous times. So here's the scoop. I've put my writing on hold of late after experiencing a close encounter with an amazing entity a year ago. I produced a short 20-minute documentary on the encounter, which reveals a cloaked seven-foot reptilian. Note, I am 100% serious. This is real, not imagined, and not a hoax like you so often see in the media on podcasts these days. Max. Max, as in Max Hawthorne, American author screen and songwriter, uh, avocational paleontologist best known for his amazing Chronos Rising series of sci-fi suspense thrillers. He's known to his fans and to my listeners as the prince of paleo fiction. Giving up writing? Whatever happened to Max, and we're going to find out, it obviously has changed the trajectory of his life. Max Hawthorne, welcome back to Strange Planet. How are you? I'm good, Rich. Thank you very, very much for having me on. I appreciate it. This happened to you uh, a year ago. I'm, I'm trying February to remember. Six, February 16th of 2023, to be exact. The first incident. Right. Just to be clear. Okay. So let's just, um, I'll have you slowly walk us through what happened. Maybe there's a kind of a build up to this story and I'll, from time to time, I'm going to interject and just ask maybe for clarification or whatever comes to mind. Um, Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, sure. Thank you. Um, Well, the, uh, the footage that uh, viewers and listeners can see on the website, on the doc, the documentary um, was filmed by myself on February 16th, around four something in the morning. Uh, it's it's on the you know the timestamp and everything is on there, and uh, I was uh, staying at a house in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, a private residence that's in a heavily wooded area. Uh, Bucks County is notorious for lots of cryptid activity, UFO activity, etc. Dozens of dogmen sightings, some of them nine feet tall. Uh, just a lot of scary, bizarre stuff. I've done shows specifically on paranormal Pennsylvania and Bucks County. You're right. It comes up time and time again. Uh, A lot of cryptids, UFO activity, Bigfoot. Um, Yeah. Go ahead. So what happened is uh, this all, this initiated because I guess, let me think about this, seven or eight years ago, it would have been of November of 2016. Uh, I don't remember the exact date off the top of my head. I think it was November 28th or 22nd, I'd have to check, but uh, I was driving home with my daughter from aftercare. She was only seven at the time, and it was uh, maybe 6.30 at night. It was already dark out, and, you know, late November, obviously, in the East Coast. It's dark at 4 p.m., but uh, and it was a, a windy night with some flurries, but the uh, temperatures were a little above freezing, so it wasn't sticking, and as we were driving along, we we're going through this development. Again, these are all in wooded areas for mm-hmm. some reason, and there was what I thought was an object lying on the road ahead of us. There was nobody else out there. I mean, everybody was having dinner already, you know, 6.30, whatever. And I said out loud, I said, oh, oh Pino, we've got a, you know, something on the road ahead, like just looks like some debris or something. So she leaned over in her car seat, so she was watching it too, which I'm glad because if I was the only one who saw it, I would, would have thought I had, it was a madman. But, uh, and there was what I thought was a small dark box, 
you know, in the center of the road. So I slowed to a crawl and I started straddling it with my tires because I didn't want to run over it because, you know, anything could be in that box. Nails. Mm. You know, you don't want to get a flat. And uh, as I was approaching it, the box started to move. The box. And since it was windy, I thought, well, that's a flap of the box and it's dark. So, it, you know, it's just popping up. But it wasn't. It was some little being, some creature um, that was like pushing itself upright. And uh, I mean, I, I spoke about this once or twice on you know, some other shows and stuff, but uh, it, uh, I believe it was injured uh, that it got maybe attacked by an owl, hit a power line or something like that, and had crash landed in the middle of the street. And it was just lying there stunned or whatever when we came upon it. So it, it pushed itself upright, and it was looking right at me. I came to a full stop at this point, and I would say it was at most 20 feet from my headlights. And we were staring at each other, and uh, it, uh, it, went, it, it let out this. We couldn't see, hear the, the, the screech or whatever it was, sound it was making because the windows were closed and it was you know, windy. But, and it, its face kind of went like, like, like that. You know, it was like the screeching and like screeching and like I don't know, anger or fear or both. Right, right. It's I, open. Yeah, its mouth is a yeah. its mouth is a gape. So you're assuming yeah. it's kind of letting out a screech. Yeah, and it had black eyes, and the mouth looked like it was black. How tall? I see, uh, its head was about the size of an apple. Okay, this okay. isn't the reptilian. This is no, what no, led no. up to the reptilian yes. being filmed. Okay, but um, which shows you like that whole area, you know, has stuff. If you're unfortunate enough or fortunate enough, as you know, people's views vary to run into it. So, um. I think it was about a foot, foot and a half tall at most as it started to stand up. And like I said, we were standing at each other and uh, this was, you know, I, I was supposed to be a veterinarian. I gave that up for, you know, personal reasons of not wanting to kill animals and stuff. But anyway, and uh, so I know, I know a lot about the animal kingdom. Okay? And my brain was fast forwarding through every species in the Northeast and stuff like, you know, raccoon, opossum, this, this, you know, groundhog, blah, 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 blah. And it was nothing that matched this thing. It sort of looked like the homunculus from the old, like, Sinbad movie, you know, like the Golden Void or something like that, yeah. but with lar larger eyes. And uh, anyway, so I, I came to full stop, and I was like, I said, like, what the heck? H-E double Yeah, your daughter's in the car with you. Your daughter's in the car, yeah, so. Yeah, right. Not to mention, I don't know what, you know, on, on the radio here, and uh, is that. And right then... It sprang up in the air, and it had wings, which I didn't know at first. That's why I said it, maybe an owl attacked it or it hit a power line. And the wings just came out, and it had a wingspan probably of between three and four feet, I want to wow. guess. It, wasn't, it was a substantial wingspan, like, you know, like bird size, but compared to the body or something. And uh, the wings were, there were two sets, like a dragonflies. They were bug-like, insect-like, okay? transparent um but they weren't shaped like a dragonflies where one is slightly larger than the other and they didn't have that that unusual taper these were like elongated ovals you know like right that, right and the same size and they were vibrating like this like like that it was like hovering or something like that and at this point and i i've said this before when it was on the ground it was like a dark gray color and when it was in the air which was about eye level with me 20 feet away okay it um it looked different so I think it could change its color. You know, I think when it was on the asphalt, it was trying to hide itself by matching the color of the asphalt, if right. that makes sense. Yes. And when it was in the air, it looked different. It looked like energized, ethereal, like silvery white almost or something like that. Like its body was different and almost transparent. And the wings were like, would have been invisible except the edges were lit up, I guess, by my headlights. And mm -hmm. they were glowing like they were like, like, lights were shooting around them like yes and it was just like doing this thing and my daughter was like it's a fairy daddy it's a fairy yeah that Which would have been my first thought yeah yeah that's, that, i mean you know and and then it, it its head like it saw her for the first time i think and then it went like shoosh, and it took off over the roof of the truck and it was gone it was an incredibly powerful flyer i wow. mean fast okay and uh I, I my whole world was like Woo. i guess you know and because, uh, you know, I might write science fiction, but, you know, seeing it up close is not the same thing. Okay? You're just sitting there so, in the uh, middle of the road. Yeah. Yeah. Stunned. Yeah. And, uh, you know, she was walking on air because she just saw a live fairy. And now fairies are real. 
Okay. And me, I'm like sitting there talking to myself. Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, and we walk into the house and I'm still, and I just go straight to a computer and I'm looking up everything from the prehistoric dragonfly, Megalorna, whatever its name is, from the Triassic or whatever, or the Carboniferous period, I think it is. And my daughter was like, Mommy, Mommy, we saw a fairy. We saw a fairy. And she's like, Oh, that's so nice. And she thought she was kidding. Uh, right. You know, but she wasn't. And, uh, you know, I couldn't explain it. You know, there was no bats that size. It wasn't a bat. It didn't have bat wings it was way too big in addition you know so the point is is i knew this this creature existed and i don't know if this was a one-off you know i don't know where it came from if it was an et it could have been anything you know so i had gone on a mission then for different areas and around there and the woods and stuff like that i would put out like trail cameras and if i have friends that you know use their houses especially if they said they'd seen something you know unusual etc right and because you don't live months, in the woods, your place isn't in the woods, so you wanted to. Oh, uh, yeah, I live in a private community. Yeah, I mean, I have woods near me, but it's not like you know, well, I'm not in the woods, if right. you know what I'm saying. Thank God. So, yeah, so what had happened is, is a few months before, um, the, I got the uh, cloaked creature, be I don't want to call him a creature, that's I think it's disrespectful, the cloaked being on film. Okay, I had had a trail camera at this one place and I had gotten after years of stuff, like a few frames of one of these winged beings, this, this flying thing, okay? And the thing, they, they were so fast that the trail camera would be triggered by motion, but by the time it was went live, the thing had already crossed the entire, you know, camera lens, whatever, width, screen width in front of it, and you only got like three frames at the very end. Well, how do those trail cams work? What are they like? They don't record fluid motion. They record what? Like a, a every what? A third well, of a no, second. You have a choice. You can do actual uh, regular video. You can do infrared video, or you can do individual frames, ah. also, or both. Okay, depending on the camera. I have some pretty good quality cameras, and I've actually modified them uh, to make them harder for uh, to be detected. Okay, which comes in handy. Leave it up. So, uh, yeah, but I got like of those frames, one of them was very telling, you know, and it will probably lead towards a, uh, an, an, a documentary in and of itself because you can see this being flying, the four wings, the limbs, the head sort of looks like an elongated ET kind of head. It has large eyes, there's black eyes, I told you about, et cetera. So I was like dancing on air that I got, you know, like finally got some proof of like, that I'm not losing my mind as one of my uh, siblings you know, accused me of and gave me so much abuse that I stopped talking to him. Wow. And that was like seven years ago. Okay. So I hold grudges, but anyway, so, um, yeah, so I was at this residence there and, uh, I'm a bit of a vampire. No, but, you just um, keep late strange hours like me. Yeah. I don't sleep well often, et cetera. Okay. Strange stuff. So, um, yeah, so it was like four in the morning or something like that. The time is on the video and everything. And, uh, uh these, uh, in this house they have a cat and the cat was like losing its mind it was like at the windows and it wanted to get out on the deck and stuff and it was seeing something it was so excited you know and everything and um in retrospect i imagine that it saw the cloak the energy field and that was what was exciting it like mm. this swirling thing that we're going to talk about in a second and because if it saw what was in the cloak i think you would have been a little hesitant would have been under the bed yeah it would have been yeah, under the bed or, yeah, or more like, like, whoa, whoa, what we got here, you know, this type of stuff. Yeah, this is but, four um, in the morning, four in the morning. Yeah, four something. I don't remember exactly. Obviously, it was pitch black out. But um, so I, being a uh, an idiot, and again, this explains why uh, women live longer than men, because we do stupid stuff, mm -hmm. okay? So I just decided, well, I guess I'm going to go out there and see what's out there. You know, and uh, so I go out there and I like the trail camera was on the top of a post on the stairs. And so I went down the stairs. I was behind the trail camera there and I'm looking and I, I was like, you know, like I had this feeling like one of these things maybe was I was going to get lucky was going to burst through the tree line, you know, or something like flying by because I didn't know that there'd be anything else unusual out there back then. I didn't know. Right. Okay? So, um. So my, my plan was, and what I did was, uh, I started getting this, like, this, I, I, um, this feeling as if, like, uh, when you take, like, a balloon, if you rub your arm on it, like the back of your arm or something Static like that. Static electricity. You know, your hand. Yeah. Yeah, you get, like, this, your hair will stand up a little bit, this type of stuff. You know, you feel this pull. Or it was kind of like um, 
if you've ever been out, like I, I fish a lot, if you're out on a boat and a storm front is moving towards you, you know, and it has a lot of like uh, electricity to it, let's mm. say, you know, you can feel that barometric pressure, et cetera. So there was something like that going on and the temperature dropped all by itself, like just dropped, like a, like something hit you, like a wave of cold and you were in it. Okay. And, uh, and you'll see this on the video because when, uh, so, so, cause when I recorded the temperature was like, I think 48 degrees, if I'm not mistaken. And then as the entity backs away, you see a jump up to 50 degrees at the end there. So you can see that there's a differential temperature generated by what conceals this being. The trail so, camera um, is recording the temperature in real time. It, yeah. It records everything. Okay. Yeah. Well, not everything, but you know, temperature. Yeah. Just and a second, uh, Max, we should point out just, um, uh, and we're going to roll into a break here in a second, but, mm -hmm. um, people can see the video at Max Hawthorne dot com the link is in the episode notes max hawthorne h-a-w-t-h-o-r-n-e max hawthorne dot com and uh, it's yeah. a max hawthorne's supernatural survivor real videos yeah. real evidence creatures you thought didn't exist but they do and i um, wondering is this a ghost demon or an extraterrestrial caught on film or in this case a um, a trail cam video in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. We'll take a quick time out back to more of my conversation with Max Hawthorne. What did he see? Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So, Help me fight big tech censorship, enjoy the complete unedited episodes, and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there. And we're here with Max Hawthorne, best-selling author, prolific author of the Kronos Rising series of books. He's known as the Prince of Paleo Fiction, and he stopped writing, or at least he's put it on hold of late because of something he saw just over a year ago, captured on a trail cam. Just very quickly, by way of recap, let me read the email he sent to me the other night. I hope this finds you well in these tempestuous times. So here's the scoop. I've put my writing on hold of late after experiencing a close encounter with an amazing entity a year ago. I produced a short 20-minute uh, documentary on the encounter, which reveals a cloaked seven-foot reptilian. Then in parentheses, note, I am 100% serious. This is real, not imagined, and not a hoax like you so often see in the media and on podcasts these days. And uh, you can check out the, uh, the video at Max Hawthorne with an E, Max, H-A-W-T-H-O-R-N-E dot com. The link is in the episode notes. And we should point, it's be, uh, point out uh, the video is behind a, uh, a paywall. I mean, you've put your, your writing career on hold after this encounter. So, you know, you need to, uh, to recoup some, some of your earnings, obviously. Well, I mean, it, it's not expensive. I mean, people subscribe, and there's going to be a lot of these documentaries. I will give you, tell you a teaser about the one that's coming next, if if you want me to later on. Yeah, but, for um, sure. So, I mean, I'm writing, directing, and producing this stuff and funding it myself, um, which is different for a writer. Usually, you write a book, they give you money, and everybody's happy. You know, you get paid for every book. Um, but here, I mean, if people want to do like just a two day like Netflix style rental. It's like six or seven dollars, which is like the price of a Starbucks coffee in some cases. You know, this is different. This is real. 
Okay. Um, it's not the BS that's out there. It's not the, you know, whatever, uh, like, you know, anything I put out there is my rep on the line is the genuine stuff. Okay. And that's just the way it goes. So you're at a, um, a friend's house in Bucks County. It's after four in the morning and mm-hmm. you have positioned a trail cam on top of a post at the, uh, I guess the bottom of the stairs in the, on the back patio on a deck. On a deck, on sorry. The, the end of the deck, yeah. Right, so you uh, you see that you're up uh, roaming around in the house and the, the cat seems to be going bonkers. It sees something outside. You decide, well, I'm going to go and check out what's out there. Maybe it's that same fairy type entity that you and your daughter mm-hmm. saw back in 2016. Uh, so you go out there and you you feel this kind of this a, a bit of an electrical, static electrical charge. You know, the, the hairs in the back of the neck. Uh, and a cold t- fr- and a cold front came right over you. Like, yeah, like a little wall. Yeah, of I mean te- textbook stuff, stuff that people experience when they're really? in the presence oh. of the, you know the paranormal. Well, uh, it was it was new for me. Let's put sure. it that way. No, um, but yeah, go ahead. But uh, and no, no. So um, so like I I was expecting one of these winged creatures to fly out of the trees and stuff like, that, especially with all this like stuff and everything. So I flashed the camera, meaning I wanted to catch it. You know like with more footage so you know ca- catch it before it like bolted past so what I, does I that mean flash it what do you mean well, flash that's what it? i call it oh. so i took my hands okay and the, let's say the camera is in front of you yours is the back of the camera and i leaned and i went ah, like this because it's okay? it's and, it's motion sensitive right so I you're activating motion it. sensor it's activated. and i do this yeah i do this all the time when i will be out somewhere if i have like a trail camera and i'm using it handheld to do infrared in video you know, I will either turn it on and time it where I will flash it to turn it on. Okay. So, and I, I have gotten some amazing stuff this way. So that's why I said, there's going to be more of these documentaries. So, you know, I'm sure we'll be talking again, but, um, anyway, so I, I set record and then I, I waited and I looked and I looked and I looked all like, you know, and nothing happened. Um, but it was starting to get really creepy out there. And the hairs, as you said, were on the back of my neck were really going up now. And I started getting a feeling like maybe this wasn't the best idea. And, you know, anything could be out here, you know, a bear, uh, whatever. I had seen mountain lion tracks one time. Um, so they say there's no mountain lions in PA. Well, they're wrong. But anyway, and uh, so I decided, you know, discretion being a better part of valor, whatever, I went back inside. In the morning, I got the footage. And I was looking at it and it looked weird. And it, I was like, well, that's the only footage I did, you know, so this is it. And it looked like as if there was some sort of, and you, you've seen the, the yeah. video. Yeah. At, at first glance, it looks like some sort of energized fog or something like that. Yes. You know, it just covers the entire screen almost and it's swirling like that. It's kind of so diaphanous. I, was, I mean, you can see through it. You can see the, it looks like the, uh, the railing of the, 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 uh, the deck. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a railing there behind it off to yeah. the side, I think to the right or something. And uh, like a cast iron railing or whatever. I don't know if that has any bearing on things. But uh, so I was trying to explain it away. And I, there wasn't any snow or hail or fog. I mean, I, you know, you, when people watch the documentary, I analyze every aspect of it. You know, so there, this is not a weather balloon. This ain't swamp gas or anything like that. Okay. Um, you forget all that stuff right now. So I thought, well, maybe it was an insect and it had landed on the camera and it's like, it's, you know how like a lot of bugs like flies, they have like translucent wings and maybe that was covering the lens or something like that. Well, I'm like, well, that doesn't make sense. It's February and the only, you know, bugs I'm aware of insects that are, are like winter moths and their wings are not transparent or translucent or anything like that. So it was a mystery. You know, and it, it, I, for days, I think I pondered this thing, staring at this footage and stuff like that. And this, the cyclone like pattern or the energy flow, it sort of looked like plasma to me, you know, seems so odd. And I'm like, I'm trying to make heads or sense, head or tails of this. So I started adjusting the contrast, okay, increasing it. And for people that, you know, the most simplest of terms, when you increase contrast, you make lights lighter, or brighter, and darks darker. Right. Okay. So if you had like a light bulb in the middle of the woods in the dark there, and you saw it at first with infrared, you know, or near IR in this case, you would see a light bulb, you would see glow around it, and then it would fade into the darkness around it. But if you kept increasing the contrast, eventually what would happen is that glow would compress, compress, compress. So eventually there was just a light bulb shape that probably would be solid white. 
Right, okay. right. So just a quick so, question. Is, is this mm-hmm. trail cam recording infrared? Mm-hmm. It is. Yes. It is what's called near IR video. So it's not a thermal, which I've been working with a lot of thermal stuff also. And I got some crazy stuff. Boy, I have uh, images of NCEs, as I call them, which means in the Max Hawthorne world, non-corporeal entities. I have images of NCEs that will make your hair fall out. Wow. I mean, you're like, you know, like that was there, you know, like I don't know if they're astral or ethereal or or they're just cloaked, but tons and tons of stuff. So anyway, but that was developed after this whole experience, okay? Because this was like the first step where, like you said, I was like, I fell into the rabbit hole, like, ah, <laughs> you know, and then your life is never the same. Fortunately, my writing skills include screenwriting, so I'm able to write the documentaries as well as, you know, everything else. So I'm not completely shelving writing, but I'm sure there's a big book in this somewhere. Um, so what happens is I start increasing the contrast. And you, you've seen the documentary yep. because it shows the, the full contrast and then like I think 50% and then 80% and even 90%, etc. cetera. And then the higher the contrast goes, the more the field contracts. Yes. And by the time you get to 80%, it becomes obvious that the field is now humanoid. Yeah, there's a shape. form there, yes. Yeah, you see, it's like a profile picture on social media. You know, you like what you're seeing from me now. Okay. Yeah. Head, neck, shoulders. Yep. Uh, Max needs to get back to the gym. Whatever. Okay. This type of thing, and um, that's what it was shaped like. Okay. So I was like, well, that's interesting. You know, I'm like, what? Is it? Like, I'm thinking, like, what am I looking at here? Okay. Now I have a large monitor, so I had the thing on there, and I reduced the speed, and then I started going through it. You know, just toggling through a few frames at a time mm. click 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 it's 20 fps frames per second and i was working my way through and somewhere in the middle of the footage all of a sudden i was staring at a face and yep. it was one of these moments where you're like you get a chill you know and i'm looking at this face and i'm like uh, you're li- i'm leaning i'm like what the he double hockey sticks is that and i have found myself using that phrase so many times in the last year because when i find something new and it's something crazy i'm like what that is that right you know and the obvious but, question um, um is this is nothing this isn't an artifact that was produced by the internal mechanism of the camera um it moves yeah it moves and okay. it has eyes and it has teeth okay and a lot of other stuff and it's not just in that one spot. You know, and I address all this stuff like this is whether this could be a reflection or this or that. You know, I've never seen a reflection with a conical head, a heavy brow ridge, heavy cheekbones, a massive jaw, a flattened muzzle, eyes with vertical pupils, and sharp teeth. Not yeah. to mention a neck, a throat with scales on it. Okay. Yeah. Sounds and reptilian. Like yeah. Sounds yeah. reptilian. Yeah. And he's a he's a big boy too. Okay, uh, like I said, conservative estimate, he's seven feet tall. Um, I did get, he, he may be bigger than that because of the fact that months later I got, um, I found some tracks in the woods in that area, and I believe that he was hunting deer. And because I had videos, the trail camera I had left out there, and two or three of them, that was a deer standing there or two, and all of a sudden they look, and then they just run for their lives, but you don't see anything chasing them. You know, which could be nothing. It could be a bobcat. It could have been, you know, some crazy person wandering the woods well, at three in the morning. Yeah, but the tracks, okay. what do they look like? Well, so the uh, there was a whole bunch of impressions in the leaf litter. And I only stopped to look at one of them. And because it had, it was very cold. It was like in the 20s the night before. And I think it was freezing at this point. But uh, so something had pushed down on there and then which propelled itself forward. And so the, the soil was mostly exposed. There was just like a couple of leaves in the way. And I plucked, you know, a few leaves away because I didn't want to disturb it or anything like that. And I found a series of claw marks, you know, carved into the, what I'm going to call permafrost. It's not really permafrost, but, yeah. you know, frozen soil. Mm. Okay. Um, and these were made by a humanoid foot with non-retractable claws. And the adding like the toe pads and the, you know, the meat on the foot, et cetera. I mean, the, the foot could be, it's Sasquatch size. Wow. Let's just put it that way. Okay. Um, and in this next documentary or one of the next two, you know, I'm going to be showing that the track and, and figuring out the size, the scale and everything else like that. 
but uh and it's interesting because its foot is sort of shaped like ours in that the you know the pinky toe mm -hmm. is smaller and then they gradually grow as it goes towards the big toe but our feet don't have non-retractable claws and they're not that big mm, I you know, know what i'm saying okay max so, another quick time out back with uh sure. more of my conversation with max hawthorne right here on strange planet hi there if you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So help me fight big tech censorship. Enjoy the complete unedited episodes and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there. The Prince of Paleo Fiction, Max Hawthorne, and the uh, Kronos Rising series of sci-fi thrillers is here, and he's put his writing on hold after the trajectory of his life uh, has been severely altered, uh, beginning in, well, I mean, how far back do we want to go? 2016, he and his, his, his uh, daughter see a strange entity hovering um, in front of their car in uh, rural Bucks County. She, uh, she cried out, Daddy, it's a fairy. Uh, fast forward to February 16th, 2023, and he captures an entity on the trail cam that is um, uh, placed outside of a friend's house in Bucks County. So you're looking, you're analyzing uh, this, this video, you're increasing the contrast to about 80%. This image starts to come through. You see eyes with um, um, vertical pupils. You yeah. see um, a broad uh, uh, or a, 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 um, a brow, heavy brow ridge, heavy brow ridge. Mm -hmm. uh, fangs, do we see fangs? There are sharp teeth, yes, visible. Neck. The mouth. Yeah, the um, so the entity um, being the uh, reptilian. I call him handsome. Okay, that's my nickname for him because I got several of them different. You know, because it kept happening after that. Um, yeah, there's another one I call Smiley because Smiley actually came up and he mugged for the camera. Wow. Like you know, he was cloaked, but I think he knew he'd be seen, and he smirked right at the in, at the lens. So how close the first time? When you were out mm -hmm. there and you're standing like six feet from him, six feet from eight, him, and you see nothing, most. so he could have killed me. He so obviously, me this thing has like cloaking ability. Yeah, but uh, so what happened is when I first saw the first image, this is what I call the grimace shot, and it's like the the best of the. There's like six or I don't know how many shots of the, of him in the video, but um, he uh, when I first saw it, it was like not. Like, I, at first I was like, oh, my God, it's a ghost. I've got a ghost on video. That's what I thought, you know. And then I looked. I'm like, well, that doesn't look like a human ghost if it's a it's a ghost, you know, and everything. It was like, you know, if, uh, is this a Bigfoot? Is this a what, – what am I looking at here? You know, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And I, as you guys are seeing the documentary, you know, there's an analysis process. It's only 23 minutes, something like that, so it's not something you got to suffer through, and you're going to enjoy it. But um, I analyzed, like, what we could be looking at. And I know he's a reptilian because I got more footage of him and I can confirm it 100%. But there's strong indicators in there. For example, when you see like his brow ridge, it has these round, what are called tubercles. 
which are like the round, bumpy scales you'll see on like certain crocodiles, lizards, things like that, okay, that are on the brow ridge and stuff. And there's like three different shots where you see his throat, and there are these rectangular, you know, symmetrical scales, right. basically, on the throat, just like you see on an alligator or a crocodile, okay? So it, the evidence of it, him being a reptilian in the first documentary is extremely strong quick question the, the, yes. does does the trail cam record audio yes okay uh, yeah, there's no there's no audio it was pin drop quiet he didn't make any noise i didn't make any noise because i didn't know he was there first off and i was waiting to, for something to fly by and right. get recorded understand so you know i think it was both we case like 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 a quiet showdown, like he's like, hmm, like this type of thing. And I'm waiting, like, you know, like oblivious to the fact that, you know, I've got like the equivalent of a bipedal dinosaur standing six or eight feet from where I am, okay? Which I probably would have had a heart attack and died on the spot, but whatever the case may be. Um, so, so yeah, so, oh, and the, the crazy part is like when you're talking about like, you know, oh, could this be something on the lens and stuff like that, is like there's like 15 frames or something like that of this grimace shot leading up to it and stuff, you know, and moving a little bit. Okay. Yeah. So this is not like, you know, this is a living creature. And I'll say this, um, the, these beings are not cold blooded reptiles, meaning they're, they have emotions. Okay. And I show this throughout the video and you've seen it. Um, one thing that's becomes apparent is that this cloak or cloak slash portal because there's a lot of weird stuff going on when you, if you look at the portal, the energy, you see other beings if you look close. Okay. So, um, and some of them are kind of scary looking, but that's okay. Cause you know, scary is all relative. You know what I mean? Like, you know, if you see a, t a 12 foot female Nile crocodile, you know, you may go, Oh my God, it's scary. But to a 16 foot male Nile crocodile, she's like Aphrodite. You see the right. beauty in the eye of the beholder, whatever. Right. So, but the, the cloak appears to function like an MRI or a CAT scan or something like that. It strips away the tissue, not physically, but what our ability to see it, it conceals it, you see? And so there are parts of it where you see almost like his skull, which by the way, is sort of similar to that of a gorilla hmm. in terms of appearance. It has a short muzzle, doesn't have a long protruding snout like you'd expect. You know, he may have human DNA in there. I don't Conical know. Conical shaped, uh, like a, what do they call the it? A, a, yeah, precipital, the, the, a precipital bun? The... No, I don't know about that part, but the mm. top of the head there is conical in shape, which is why I thought maybe it was a Bigfoot, but it's not. Um, but uh, so you see his skull, and when he was first recorded, he was turned to the side like this. He was facing to his right, which would have been my left. And I, I mean, you know, I don't know what he was thinking at the time. If he was looking around, you know, he's like, hmm, there's a human here. What am I going to do with him, you know, or whatever and stuff, you know. But um, and then he turns forward, and there's this moment where his eyes pop and I believe that it suggests that he realized he was being recorded. You know, like he looks startled to me. Okay. And people could judge for themselves, but, uh, and this also suggests that they know about trail cameras and everything else. And I'm sure they do because these beings of, you know, are light years literally ahead of us in terms of technology, et cetera. I mean, they have, now they're just super advanced beings. So a trail camera for them to, to them is probably like a cave drawing for us to us. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, like, or maybe the first camera that ever existed, you know, on those giant tripods in the old West or something like that. Okay. So anyway, but, um, so the point is, is there's a lot of, uh, emotions that you see him exhibit throughout the, uh, the video and the grimace shot, is it makes me laugh a little bit, you know, when I talk with my discuss with some of my people and stuff about this, but because first he gets startled, his eyes are like this, like, like that and everything. And, and then his head leans back and you've seen it. So he's kind of leaned back a little like this. And he's like, like this, like, ah, like that. And to me, that's the, Oh man, I'm going to get fired for this <laughs> kind of expression. Busted. And I'm serious. Yeah. Or I am so getting written up for this, or I am going to hear it, you know, or something like that, you know? And this makes me, I mean, obviously they must have, they have a civilization and a chain of command, et cetera. I believe that these guys are observers, you know, watchers that, you know, just study people 
places, whatever. Did you did you share this footage with the owner of the house? Yes. Wait. Mm, I showed some of it, and the, the reaction was like, like, oh, I don't see anything. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. Um, it, probably best that he doesn't get <laughs> become too yeah. aware. If he's living there all the time. Because some people have seen, like, the Grimace shot, and they think it's a demon. Like, that's their reaction. But it's not. you got to remember that, first off, that, the, like I said, the cloak strips away tissue. It's part of the invisibility process. Okay, I don't know how exactly how it works. I'm theorizing. But I've seen enough of it to know something. Like, for example, if you take your arm and you go to x-ray it, Okay, and it's going to get rid of the flesh, and you're going to see the bone. Mm -hmm. Okay, you might see some outlines of the flesh, etc. If you increase the intensity, you won't see any of that. You'll see just bone. And if you go far enough, even the bones will disappear, and you'll just have a black film. Right now, that would be, of course, very unhealthy for the person whose arm was exposed to that much X-ray radiation or whatever. Okay. Oh, by the way, I ran a Geiger counter over the area too, just so you know. So we'll talk about that in the next documentary. But anyway, so the point is, is that that's how it works. So, or appears to, I should say. And so when you're seeing him in the grimace shot, it's like his epidermis is missing. Like it's been stripped away by it, you know? So it looks, he looks scarier than he would normally be. You know, like if, if my skin was all missing, it'd be like a horror movie. Right, right. You know what I mean? Did you ever think I mean, though, if, if, um, Let's assume that this isn't, just for a moment, this isn't an extraterrestrial or it's not a reptilian. And, you know, there are lots of, there's lots of debate as to whether the reptilians are, are even extraterrestrial. They may be, you know, from here and they were underground and they've been here before we were here. Mm -hmm. um, let's maybe take it into the realm of the, the supernatural, the paranormal. Um, if it is, let's say, demonic, supernatural, mm -hmm. I mean, it could project whatever it wants, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the the cloak is designed to conceal him um that's a, a given and it may also be a mode of transport when he backs away from me you'll see him pull back and then it, you've seen it and, yeah. it goes, and it kind of sucks in on itself and it's gone okay you don't see the exact moment the full disappearance you see it shrinking because the 30 second clip runs out right unfortunately right okay but since I'm still standing here, you know, and he didn't do anything to me, obviously, you know, that. And that tells you something also, by the way. They must have some sort of code of conduct because why would he allow this? You know what I mean? He could have taken the camera. He could have done something to me, et cetera, this type of thing. You know, it didn't happen. But I am, I can, uh, let's put it this way. Um, I have other images of him from additional footage, and it is 100% a reptile of some kind. All right. Okay. And this is, this is part um, one and there'll be more documentaries coming again. People can go to max Hawthorne.com Hawthorne, H A W T H O R N E max Hawthorne.com. The link is in the episode notes. Just click it, sign up. And, um, um, there are more videos, trail camera videos and pictures. And I have something that will, let me just say one, th how much time do we have left? Uh, just a couple, uh, two minutes. Okay. Oh my God. I gotta be quick then. So the first thing is, is that I believe hundred percent he's a reptilian. The cloak could make him disguise him as anything, but he wasn't expecting to be filmed. True. So he was just hiding. So he was in his natural state in my opinion. Okay. So there's that. Um, another documentary that's coming is, you know, those ABCs that people see all the time, alien big cats. Yes. Yeah, the phantom yes. cats. Yeah. The big black cats in yep. the UK, especially. Yes. Yeah. I have one on video, 20 seconds of it. Okay, from 20 feet away, okay, and it's going to show the world what they are. Wow. And I'll tell you a secret. They're not cats. So. There you go. Wow. At least not all the time. Let's just put it that way. So, looking wow. forward to it, man. I uh, I can see why you've had to put everything on hold, uh, the writing, that is. Um, how could this not change your life entirely? It's um, become a full-time thing, you know, and I just, uh, I am blessed to be learning this stuff, and I, I love being able to share with people. It's difficult because there's so much hoaxing out there that a lot of people are like, oh, that's BS, you know, whatever. I'm not going to 
spend, you know, six, seven dollars to see, uh, you know, whatever and stuff like that. So, you know, you get a lot of jadedness out there and I understand that and all. But the truth is, is I'm going to slowly bring stuff out and more and more people will learn, you know, without causing any problems or panic or whatever and stuff. And, you know, it'll, the world will be a better place. All right. Well, until part power. two, we, I forgot to mention, we tried to record yesterday and right in, uh, we were about 10, 15 minutes in and all the power went out in your house. And yes, uh, I know for six minutes. And then I tried to reach out to you and I was sending you an email to explain that the power going out and then bam, I couldn't even send you the email. It went out for like hours. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know if some, something or someone is trying to interfere with uh, our recording, but we got this one in the can and um, I look forward to, to part two and part three, Max Hawthorne, chronosrising.com for his uh, fantastic series of books. He's the Prince of Paleo Fiction and maxhawthorne.com. Uh, maxhawthorne.com, the link is in the episode notes. It's Max Hawthorne's Supernatural Survivor um, documentary. And uh, go and check it out. Max, be safe and uh, we'll talk again soon, I hope. Richard, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is... I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So help me fight big tech censorship. Enjoy the complete unedited episodes and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there.